morning to all our guests. I am Farik. And I am Sini of CFA Society Malaysia. We are very delighted to have all of you here today on a bright Saturday morning. It's wonderful for us to be hosting you today to celebrate this occasion. A warm welcome to our keynote guest speaker for today, Tan Sri Nazir Raza. <laughs> Guests of honour, our esteemed employer partners, valuable collaborative partners, mentors and mentees, respected society members, candidates and guests. Now, without further ado, we would like to call upon Chong Jin Yong, the President of CFA Society Malaysia, to give his welcome note. Very good morning and a warm welcome to our keynote guest speaker, Tan Sri Nazir Raza. Guests of honours, partners of the CFA Society Malaysia, our employer partners from our employer recognition program, affiliated universities, society members, candidates, Yes, and last but not least, our mentors and mentees. It is indeed a great pleasure and honour for me to be given the opportunity to address you all this morning. So, this morning, if you can just spare just a couple of minutes, I would like to take you down memory lane for our society. 25 years ago, in 1997, our society was formed with Lee Kalun as the founding president. Yes, we will be celebrating our Silver Jubilee this year. The University Affiliation Program uh, started out as the program partner of CFA Institute in 2006, and University Malaya was one of the first institutions accorded that status, I believe, back in 2012. In 2007, the global competition, CFA Institute Research Challenge, began and Malaysia participated right from the first edition and has been doing so ever since. And oh, in 2016, we hosted the Olympics. Okay, I'm kidding. But I'm sure you do notice the Rio logo in the lower right picture. But we did actually organize our inaugural career day in the same year of 2016. And this year it's back in its physical form next month after a two year of virtual events. Right? And in 2018, the first Ethics Challenge competition was jointly organized with the CFA Society of Singapore. So, what happened in 2020, 2021? You might think that oh, with MCO and lockdowns, we would throttle back, slow down, but no. Instead, we launched the Bloomberg Hackathon, the Youth Ambassador Program, and built the foundations leading to the Employers Recognition Program, as represented by many of our distinguished guests here today. And yes, of course, the Mentoring Program, the reason why we are here today, was also launched in that period. There's also the ESG Investing Certificate, where already we have a pioneer batch of 24 certified professionals, some of whom are in attendance here today. The ESG Investing Cert is something the next speaker will tell you a little bit more about. Where are we now today as a society? We have 15 employer partners in the Employer Recognition Program, 15 affiliated universities from just one, and yes, we are the winner of the Most Outstanding Society Award for 2022 among the 160 over plus CFA societies around the world. Yes, that's definitely deserve a round of applause. That's a lot of accomplishment to be proud of. But we must remember it was only possible because I'm standing. Uh, no, we, the current members, are standing on the shoulders of the giants that came before us. Who are some of these giants from our past. We have four former presidents of CFA Society Malaysia right, who are also here today who are still actively volunteering their time in support of society and its mission both here and on the global stage. Dato Islan, the Deputy <laughs> Chief of Security of Securities Commission in Malaysia. Tio Kok Lin, who has been very supportive of our research challenge and is also active with the Chinese Chamber of Commerce 
Industry Malaysia. Jason Lee, who's currently the President Council's representative uh, for Asia Pacific South. And Justin Ong, who started Career Day and now is the chair of the Asia Pacific Research Exchange. But of course, we also have two young giants who won the Global Young Leaders Award from CFA Institute uh, two years in a row, right? Well, one of them is also here, Farid, who is the, one of the MC, and of course, Jeannie. It is only fitting that this being the mentoring graduation ceremony, I take this opportunity to acknowledge the contribution of our predecessors, our society's mentors, so to speak, as we learn from their mistakes, experience, and sharing that has made all this accomplishment possible today. And among these senior mentors of the society is, of course, Geoffrey Ng, who is the first Malaysian elected to the Board of Governor of CFA Institute, the highest governing body of the institute. So, to get today's program going, I would like to invite Geoffrey on stage to say a few words and provide his introductory note to another giant of our industry, whom we will soon have the privilege of listening to today. Geoffrey. Thank you very much, Jin Yong, President of CFA Society Malaysia. A very good morning, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and friends. Very nice to see uh, old faces and, and old friends uh, with us today. This year marks the 75th year since the formation of the CFA Institute setting the foundations to establishing the CFA Institute's mission today, which I think many of you here would know, which is to lead the investment profession globally by promoting the highest standards of ethics, education, and professional excellence for the ultimate benefit of society. With more than 160 plus CFA societies around the world, serving a membership base exceeding 170,000 and a candidate population of more than 300,000, the CFA Institute continues to evolve its leadership of the, of the investment profession, whilst recognizing and promoting the principles that the practice of investment management carries a, a great responsibility that demands the highest standards of care among those who are privileged to make it their career. We continue to evolve with the industry. Our CFA program, which is the, world, the gold standard and global uh, passport of investment professional education, is capturing the key knowledge areas of modern investment practice and technology. We have introduced globally the CFA uh, Certificate in ESG Investing, which Jin Yong had just uh, referred to, which has now received a phenomenal response with more than 18,000 registrations globally. In November 2021, the CFA Institute had also issued the Global ESG Disclosure Standards for Investment Products, which are the first global voluntary standards for disclosing how an investment product considers ESG issues in its objectives, investment strategy, and stewardship activities. We are also introducing new professional learning programs that include data science, decentralized finance for investment professionals, risk, me uh, risk measurement, attribution, and performance appraisals, and of course, investment manager selection. At CFA Institute and CFA Society Malaysia, we herefore look forward to working with our esteemed uh, employer partners and industry participants to advance investment practices and achieve our mission uh, in, uh, in Malaysia. So thank you for that. Let me now introduce the giant who, who will be speaking to us this morning. Um, <clears throat> before I start, I just wanted to say that the difference between ordinary and extraordinary is that little extra. That little extra of extraordinary is no other than Tansri Nazir Raza, who has both who has both trailblazed and set new standards of banking and investments in Asia. Nazir has been a staunch supporter of the CFA Institute's mission and CFA program, as witnessed by CMB Group today being one of the largest employers of CFA charter holders in Malaysia. Nazir is currently the chairman and founding partner of Iklas Capital. He is also non-executive chairman of Bank Pembangunan Malaysia Berhad and PLS Berhad. He has had an illustrious 29-year career with CMB Group where he served as CEO and non-executive chairman for 15 and four years, respectively. He was a driving force behind CIMB Group's rise from an investment bank into a regional universal bank in ASEAN, with various accolades to both his and CIMB's name. 
Nazir has been active in both philanthropy and advocacy. He founded the CIMB Foundation in 2007, and then as a prostate cancer survivor, he joined the Board of Trustees for the Urological Cancer Trust Fund of U University Malaya. He also advocates for a more inclusive democracy to achieve national reset of Malaysia via the setting up of the Better Malaysian Citizens Assembly. As you very well know as well, Nazir is the best-selling author of What's in a Name, <laughs> which with his attempt to understand his father Tun Raza as a person and a leader, he then shared his career journey at CIMB as well as navigating the political economy that was part of the Tun Razak legacy. His career then collided with, with, with the 1MDB scandal, forcing him to make some fateful personal choices. And at the end of the book, he shares his critical anal analysis of the Malaysian political economy and recommends a way forward for a national reset. Nazir holds a Bachelor of Science from Bristol Uni University and a Master of Philosophy from Cambridge University. He was a visiting fellow at the Oxford Centre for Islamic Studies and at the Blavatnik School of Government, or BSG, at Oxford University. He's currently a member of the B BSG's International Advisory Board. So on behalf of CFA Society Malaysia, uh, our President Jun Yong, it gives me great honour to welcome on stage Sansvi Nazir Raza. Thank you, uh, Jeffrey, uh, for that uh, introduction. Uh, it was so detailed, you basically gave my speech almost. So, uh, and Jin Yong, uh, thank you for that introduction and also update on the CFA Society. I must say, uh, I was very impressed uh, because from my time, CFA was just the cool um, qualification to get. I didn't realize you also have a society and the society does lots of things like this mentor, uh, mentee program uh, that we are uh, celebrating uh, today. Uh, my colleague uh, Winston, uh, who works uh, uh, at, at, at my family office, uh, was telling me, uh, inviting me to come today and say, you know, you just have to speak to a lot of young people. I come here, I've got the uh, CEO of Bursa, the Deputy CEO of uh, Securities Commission, I see the CEO of HSBC, uh, I see the Deputy CEO of CIMB Investment Bank, so uh, there's some false representation uh, there, uh, but, but never mind. Uh, but thank you for having me anyway, uh, and um, thank you also uh, for uh, agreeing uh, to pay uh, the cost of having me speak, uh, which is to donate to my favourite charity, uh, the uh, uh, Urology uh, Trust Foundation, uh, as you, uh, some of you would have read. Uh, I am a prostate cancer survivor, uh, so uh, I uh, support uh, this uh, um, cause uh, really to basically elevate the uh, degree of awareness uh, about uh, prostate cancer. Um, you know, and they say prostate cancer is actually the best cancer to get uh, because it's eminently treatable. Uh, the only thing is you must catch it early. Uh, and in Malaysia, uh, the current um, uh, run rate is that 60% of the cases we get are discovered too late, yeah, uh, where you know the cancer is already spread. Uh, the normal run rate for other countries uh, of our uh, stage of development is about 30%. Uh, so uh, our cause is to raise awareness so that more and more people know about it and more people know what to do uh, to, to kind of make sure uh, they don't get uh, surprised uh, by it. In my case, you know, the only reason I, I, I think I'm alive today is because CIMB uh, asked me to buy an insurance product, uh, which then <laughs> required me to do a blood test. Uh, I'm not trying to pitch for CIMB. Uh, uh, as you know, e class owns 5% of MBank, not CIMB. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, they saved my life. So, again, you know, I just want other people to know, those of you probably, most of you in this room, not so relevant, but, you know, for those between 50 uh, and 70, you really uh, should take a test uh, every year. Now, back to uh, today's uh, conversation. I think, you know, uh, we're going to have a fireside chat. So, um, really, I think the most interesting part will be uh, to take questions and just, you know, uh, answer. I've already committed that there are no questions that are uh, off limits uh, for today. Uh, so, I think that will be the more fun part. Uh, but today, I just wanted to say that, you know, those of you who are coming out of this uh, mentor-mentee program. It is an exciting time. Uh, you are at that uh, early stage of a career. You can look forward uh, with optimism that if you work hard, 
and you work smart, then you will get the success uh, that you deserve. Probably. Probably because actually to get the success that you deserve, you cannot take it for granted. Yeah, you must work hard, you must work smart. But you also have to understand the environment you work in, be it in the company, be it in society at large. And that's probably um, uh, the most useful thing I can say uh, to all of you. And you know, there are hard realities uh, of work life that you must anticipate. Uh, you must be aware, you must anticipate, and you must uh, navigate. Luck, uh, again, is necessary, uh, but you can make uh, your own luck uh, as well. Right? So if you sit there, you work hard, you work smart, and you say, why the hell am I not getting promoted? Why the hell am I not rising up the corporate ladder? Well, uh, it's because it doesn't happen automatically. Yeah, you have to understand how to uh, climb the ladder. Yeah. Um, so uh, firstly, uh, you must choose the right job. Right? Uh, and you know, a lot of clever people with high potential chose the wrong, wrong jobs. Yeah, and they don't rise up. Uh, and you know, the right job uh, is different for different people, obviously. Uh, in my case, uh, when I came back, uh, I um, interviewed in a number of companies, uh, multinationals, uh, investment banks, and all that. And I, you know, I narrowed it down to say, that, okay, I need to kind of understand corporate Malaysia, so let me choose an investment bank. And I basically interviewed with two. Uh, one was um, Arab Malaysian, which is called Ambank today which was the biggest, by far the biggest, the most established player at that time. They were winning all the deals. Versus CIMB, which was the seventh uh, largest of 12 uh, merchant banks that Malaysia had those days. Uh, I interviewed in these two companies and I decided on CIMB. Why? I decided in CIMB for two things. I went there and I, I, I could feel the culture uh, in, 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 during the interview. I felt the culture was right for me. I went to uh, Arab, or oh, Ambank, and the head of HR was interviewing me. Yeah, and I kind of read from that conversation that I needed to impress the head of HR, which wasn't very interesting for me. Whereas in CIMB, I was being interviewed by my uh, potential uh, boss. Uh, and he was very much sort of, you know, you come here, you work here, this is the deal. I will train you up. I will torture you, I will train you. Uh, and, um, um, you know, I will help you rise up the corporate ladder. And that's, I think, what worked for me, right? An organization that was a sort of can-do organization. Even as a rookie, I, could, I felt I could influence the organization. Uh, and I had a boss uh, who was uh, really committed to training me. And I think that's very important for the younger generation. Yeah. Uh, and so that, what, that worked for me. Uh, please think about what works uh, for you. Yeah. Uh, if you read my book, obviously, um, it's here, if you haven't read it, uh, you've got to pay me for it, but it's here. Um, um, I will tell you the story of my first boss, who I really wanted to work for, but he was the man in corporate finance uh, those days, in the um, uh, late 80s, early 90s. He was the man, uh, and we were lucky to have a job, uh, and he was tough on me. Uh, my first piece of work was a book this thick, uh, to be submitted to the Capital Issues Committee or the Securities Commission, it's called today. And my first piece of work was so bad, he picked it, he threw it uh, at my head. You know, in those days, you guys won't accept it, but you probably sue him today. Uh, but those days, I was lucky to get a job. I said, okay, no problem, I'll do better next time, uh, and you know, went back to my desk. So uh, that, was, uh, that was then, uh, this is now, but uh, you know, the main point I want to make was pick your, the right company, pick the right boss. Secondly, I think um, you need to also manage your own career path within an organization. HR ain't going to do it for you. HR has their templates. You have to know what's right for you. You've got to nav navigate the organization. Um, I, in my case, uh, decided that you know, uh, what would be good was, it wasn't really done so much then, which is to move between departments. Uh, so I kind of you know, uh, lobbied my way to work at, in different departments. I went from corporate finance uh, to the equities business, uh, and uh, so I got lucky. Uh, as I said, you know, you make your own luck. 
I moved from corporate finance to equities at a time when um, the equities market was just taking up, taking off. You know, those were the early 1990s uh, when the world, world of uh, fund managers discovered uh, the tiger economies, and you know, suddenly um, our broken companies were, uh, you know, profits uh, went from negligible to um, huge amounts. And in CIMB's case, I think the Merchant Bank was, uh, uh, the broken house used to make one or two million, the Merchant Bank made about 15 million, and suddenly the bull run came, Merchant Bank made 20 million, the broken company made 60 million. So it was sort of tail wagging the dog. And guess who was in charge of the tail? I was. You know, I was, I was in the equities uh, institutional departments, I was making a lot of that money. Uh, and in an organization like that those days, when you make money, you can ask for what you want. Uh, and that's how I rose up uh, the ladder. So when they were looking, uh, for a CEO, uh, there was someone who had control of a big part of the PNL, and someone who had experience in different departments, uh, and that's really how I got uh, the 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 CEO job uh, at a relatively uh, young age. Um, and and in my case, I guess you know one is to move around, two is anticipation. Uh, I anticipated somehow uh, that you know going into broking uh, would be uh, good for me, so. Uh, you know, uh, designing your career path uh, to the top is, is, is important. Now, um, <clears throat> the third thing that I think uh, is important is this, is what I call man in the mirror. Yeah, uh, those of you from my generation knows it comes from a Michael Jackson song. Yeah, uh, but really what it is, is to make sure that you regularly look in the mirror and look at yourself. I think what is most important is to understand you yourself, right? What you're good at, what you're not so good at. That is, I think, the most important trait to have uh, in rising up the corporate ladder. I used to do it all the time. I used to look in the mirror. Uh, after deciding that I was quite good looking, I would then say, okay, what are my strengths and weaknesses? Uh, that's one. And double down on the strengths and mitigate the weaknesses. When I became CEO at 32, I said, look, um, what are my weaknesses? My weakness is that I'm so young, I'm so hot-tempered, I'm so impatient. So what did I do? I put a lot of gray hairs around me. My you know, inner circle were full of uh, 40, 50 year olds then uh, to make sure they calm me down. Uh, I was more careful uh, with my uh, decisions. Yeah? Uh, the second thing you need to ask yourself is, are you right for the job? Yeah? Uh, when I became CEO, I looked in the mirror, I said, am I right for the job? I said, yes. When I merged CIMB with Bank Bumi, I said, am I right for the job? I said, yes. When in 2014, I looked at what was needed to be done to transform CIMB yet again, I looked in the mirror, I said, am I right for the job? I said, no. Yeah, that's when I said, I need to hand over to Zaf. That was, you know, uh, a personal decision. I wasn't in 2014, I didn't have the energy uh, and um, <clears throat> the, the, the kind of right um, history uh, to take on the job of transforming CIMB once again. Uh, so it's very, very important that when you're not right for the job, you basically uh, realize it and move on. Yeah, um, you know, perhaps when you're 90, you're probably not right for being PM either, so you shouldn't uh, take that job. Yeah, so uh, these are uh, the things we need to decide for ourselves. Yeah. Then the other important element is teamwork. You yourself, you're capable, you're good at what you do. But really, if you can't work with other people, you should teach. Yeah, that's what you should do. Because in work life, it's about teams. Yeah, what it's about leverage. It's about creating those right teams. And, and within that, you know, I always say that, you know, Malaysia, we're so lucky because we're very diverse. You know, I used to spend a lot of time in CIMB making sure that teams were diverse. I got very upset when people did what I call cloning. You know, in corporate finance uh, those days, you know, at the beginning, I was, I was the first non-Malay in, I was the first non-Malay and first fresh graduate that CIMB had employed. Yeah, uh, and then when I look around the room, everybody pretty much looked the same, uh, kind of uh, spoke the same lingo. That's not diversity. Yeah, and you know, I think CIMB got better and better as we became more diverse. Uh, and you know, we're a country rich in terms of 
you know, gender, in terms of age, in terms of ethnicity, pick those diverse teams. It just makes logical sense. You know, if you're trying to build a business, you've got a customer base, you bring different types of people to talk to different customers. You look at problems differently. If you only have accountants uh, in, 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 in your team, then you're always going to look at the problems from a numerical perspective. Yeah, it's inevitable. No, dis no disrespect to accountants, but you've got to have people who can see it from the maybe the advertising standpoint, the communication standpoint, uh, and so on. So pick those uh, diverse teams. It's very, very important uh, that you, know, um, you are able to work in teams. And when you build teams, do not fear having people who are smarter than you. Because when they're your subordinates, they make you smarter. I remember some of you will know Dr. Amida of uh, uh, CIMBHR then, you know, when she first uh, uh, was rising up the ladder, her annual review with me was always the same thing. I said, your problem is you will never grow because you're, you worry that someone smarter than you will take your job. Yeah, and don't fear that. If people deserve your job, they're going to take your job anyway. But if you get a subordinate who's smarter than you, they will make you smarter. Yeah, uh, that's power. To be able to leverage on someone who's smarter than you is power. Yeah, so bear that in mind. When you, when you construct your teams, diversity, and don't fear uh, people who are uh, smarter uh, than you. So those are some of my guide notes uh, for those of you who are of the uh, younger generation. Be optimistic, uh, work hard, work smart, but also understand uh, that you know, there's some realities of working in a company that you have to build uh, as you plan uh, your careers. Then. As you rise up the corporate ladder, context becomes more and more important. Navigating the context um, of your, of, of, uh, for you, for your company, and for your customers is very important. So understand uh, the big uh, picture. And, you know, and that big picture for us is, of course, Malaysia. And how do I look at the Malaysian um, environment? Well. I always say, only half jokingly, that Malaysia doesn't really have an economy. You know, we have a political economy, uh, and you have to understand that uh, in order to um, 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 do your stuff, uh, if you like. Uh, and you know, uh, I always um, say environment is very important. Uh, during my career, there were two big m and deals. One went very well, called Synergy Drive. Uh, when CIMB pulled together seven public companies, merged them, and created the enlarged Sangdabi Group. Yeah, uh, that was an audacious deal. Uh, we were, uh, CIMB then had, you know, uh, I think market capitalization of about 12 billion or so, uh, and we bought uh, seven PLCs worth about 30 over billion. Yeah, put them together and then uh, sold it back to. Uh, uh, to PNB. That was an audacious deal and it that created the merger uh, that the stakeholders or the government wanted. That went well because at that time we had a strong government, we had a strong PM, we had, we had, we, he was very clear that this is a deal uh, that is good for Malaysia. So the, the system worked uh, for a deal like that. And guess what? There was no social media. Yeah, there was no hashtags. Uh, so, you know, uh, so long as the press were so long the Star, New Straits Times, uh, and the Edge were okay, it was okay. Yeah. Uh, then come a bit later when I tried to bring together Air Asia and Malaysia Airlines. Uh, then we got the, the political context wrong. Yeah. You're trying to put together uh, two um, groups of, of staff who had been fighting each other for years. You try and put them together. Uh, and uh, we made one big mistake, which was at the time I remember talking to the uh, Prime Minister at the time, I said, you know, look, this is one deal we could do. And then he said, look, I'm not ready to give Tony Fernandez the keys uh, to the national airline. Uh, so let's go halfway. Let's just do uh, this share swap. Uh, and it's, it's kind of halfway house. Uh, and, um, you know, it could be undone. So therefore, there was tremendous... Uh, pressure to undo it. Uh, so that deal uh, didn't happen because we got the context wrong. So uh, what is that Malaysian context? Well, firstly, you've got to understand that there's a very, very heavy presence of the government. That's why I call it a political economy, you know, in terms of licenses, permits, 
uh, as well as the GLCs around. You've got to play uh, with that context. And so a lot of business decisions have political overtones. Uh, and sometimes it's easy to understand the overtones because you say from a political standpoint, there is the voters, so therefore they want to make a popular decision. That's easy enough to understand. Yeah. What is more difficult to understand is when it is actually about political funding. That's much more difficult to understand because it's not clear who is actually you know, writing the bigger check. Yeah. And this country today, political funding is almost unregulated. Yeah. So you don't really know. Sometimes when you look at decisions, you can't get it. Right? Uh, you know, and you know, I speculate, I don't know the truth, uh, but I speculate that's probably why there was no windfall tax on the glove companies. Yeah, because you know, the political funding check is bigger uh, than the, what they could deliver, uh, or more meaningful than what they could deliver uh, via the windfall tax. Yeah. Uh, so this is distortive uh, political funding. And so all this politics affects investments, competition, uh, impacts morale, uh, etc. But it's something uh, that you have to bear in mind. So what do you do? What do you do? Well, there are two things. One, you have to navigate it day to day because that's the way the system is. You have to build it into your calculations. When you bid for projects, you've got to understand the politics of it all. I mean, this is slightly different, but I remember when we bid it for the Tanaga IPO, for instance, right? I, we calculated that, look, who is going to decide? At that time, we worked it out that at Tanaga, the employees and the management and employees were very, very powerful. So what do we do? How do we win the deal? We basically put in really, really attractive stock options for the employees of Tanaga. If you look at the Tanaga prospectus in 1992, it was not just the usual ESOS, pink form. There's also something called employee loyalty scheme. That means you, if an employee buys the shares, hold on to the shares, you get even some more shares. Yeah, that was the key uh, to us winning the deal. So understanding you know, who, is, who is going to make decisions uh, is very important uh, when you make your, your bids uh, and tenders. But as you navigate that, do not comprise a compromise on your own integrity. Yeah, do not do that. It's a very, very slippery slope. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, once you cross the line the first time, it's, very, it's much easier to do it a second time. Yeah. Once you do it a second or third time, after that, you don't know where the line is already. Yeah. So do not do that. It is not worth it. Yeah, you cannot sleep well and you, you, you probably be, get caught out at some point. Yeah. So maintain that, yeah. uh, please, because the more people do it, the more uh, hopeful we are one day uh, we can actually have a better Malaysian corporate sector. The other side, the other thing you can do is actually advocate for change. Yeah. Um, change in a sense that you must be on the side of separating business and politics. You have to support this whole notion of having rules for political funding. You have to support, you should support the notion of a reform of GLCs in terms of how imposing they are uh, on the economy. I've, I've been very clear that what we need to do now is basically break up GLCs into four groups. GLC, GIC, GA, and GCFS. That's what I say. The GLCs is the government-linked companies which are strategic. You could argue that Bursa Malaysia is strategic, possibly. Or you could argue that you know telecom is strategic or Malaysia Airlines is strategic, so fine. They are government-owned companies, and then you create a framework for those government-owned companies. What do they do? Yeah, they basically should be transparent that, yes, we make profits, but our KPIs are also these other things. That means, you know, uh, impact on society and so on. Two is, you must have GICs, which is government investee companies. Those companies are owned by government by virtue of the fact that there's so much savings controlled by the government, like CIMB, like Maybank. Right? The government shouldn't be involved. In fact, you could have rules to say that even though you are 30-40% shareholders of these public companies, you restrict the, the government's right to vote so that it really is the, the, the private sector and the board that controls 
uh, these companies. Yeah. Um, then you could have uh, the um, government agencies or GAs. Those are like SEDCs and all that. Those are government agencies, and they're different uh, to 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 uh, to um, uh, the listed companies, etc. And finally, of course, the GCFS, which is the government companies for sale. We need to go through a transparent process of selling uh, these companies. I mean, it's it's it's. You know, it's a process. In the early 2000s, we had a fantastic time with GLC reforms. And we stabilized a lot of GLCs, these big companies, as they came out of the crisis. Right? The next phase uh, is this, uh, which is we have to divest and we have to get government uh, to step back. Uh, that is uh, my, my proposal. Uh, and, but the overall big picture is as Jeffrey mentioned, uh, is this idea that I have that Malaysia needs to evolve into a better Malaysia. Uh, and the only way we can do that is, I think, uh, to create or to introduce a uh, citizens' assembly, um, which is another way of describing it is deliberative democracy, which is something that's been adopted in 28 countries already. Many, many countries are frustrated with the, their own political systems. My argument is that in Malaysia, 1957, we got the Westminster system from the British. We didn't know whether it was right for Malaysia. We knew it was right for Britain, but we didn't know it was right for Malaysia. But we took it like, because the colonial master said this is good. So we took it. In 1969, that system collapsed. We didn't know what to do, so we introduced 2.0. That 2.0 our designers of 2.0 um, thought that it should last for 20 years. But it's 50 years, it's still there. 2.0 of new economic policy, 2.0 of you know, the Sedition Act, 2.0 of uh, Barisan dominant party. That system was only last, meant to last for 20 years. It's now 50 years, it doesn't work anymore. It is that system that has you know, then spawned this whole uh, political economy, etc., uh, etc. Et uh, I don't want to go into so much detail here. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions, but my point is we need a Malaysia 3.0. And that 3.0 we can only arrive at after going through a process. And that process is a citizen's assembly. France has done it, um, 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 Ireland has done it, etc., etc. Not in, in a holistic way, but in, in, in significant ways. And Chile now has, is setting up a citizens' assembly in order to overhaul its constitution. Uh, so that is a process uh, that Malaysia needs. Yeah, Malaysia needs to go through that process so uh, we can arrive at this. And if we sit around and wait for parliament to do it, it ain't going to happen. They are not going to overhaul a system that got them there in the first place. Yeah, it, we need to go offline uh, to overhaul uh, the system. And that is uh, my recommendation. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, so that I don't take time from the Q&A, I just wanted to wrap up by saying this, that corporate Malaysia has enormous potential. Malaysia has enormous potential. We are so, so lucky to have a country that has so much in terms of natural resources, uh, uh, talent, geographical location, etc. That this country, think about it, how much money has this country wasted? Huge amounts. But yet we are where we are today. That is how much potential this country has. What we want to do, we must do, is bring uh, Malaysia to a place where it can realize that potential. And it's urgent because in Industry 4.0 era, if we, you know, time in time, more and more countries will overtake us. It is uh, uh, 4.0 will allow countries to leapfrog, yeah, by using technology. So countries that nation league table. Uh, we fluctuate tremendously because of 4.0, so we don't have much time. So I believe that we need 3.0 now, otherwise more and more talents will go up. I know um, just now I was told that you know we have something like 3,000, Singapore has 3,000 CFA yeah, graduates of, uh, in their society, of which 1,000 are Malaysians or something like that. that was, I almost cried when I heard that stat. Yeah, uh, I was just in Singapore a few days ago uh, talking to the CEO of Tomasi Dilan who grew up in KL. His parents are Malaysians, right? The best of Singapore is Malaysians. Yeah, why? Why do we allow that? Think about it. Yeah, so 
ladies and gentlemen, let me end by saying, you know, good luck in your careers. I hope uh, that a few tips I gave you uh, will be useful. Uh, and I hope that you also uh, join the right side uh, of the cause of transforming uh, Malaysia. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tantri, for your insight. Please do take a seat on the stage. Now we will open up the Q&A session to the floor. And for that, I would like to invite Winston Lee to join Tantri on the stage as the moderator. Winston Lee, a charter holder, is an investment manager who leads research, deal advisory, investment monitoring at Zac Capital, a single family office headquartered in Malaysia, focusing on mezzanine capital, venture capital, and equity opportunities within Asia Pacific. He also provides non-discretionary portfolio management services to high net worth clients. Over to you, Tan Sri and Wilson. Uh, thank you, Sini and, and Farid. Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, morning to uh, Jin Hong, uh, uh, CFA committee, uh, esteemed uh, guests, ladies and gentlemen. Um, yes, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, as you know, uh, today I have the privilege of uh, moderating these questions uh, for my boss. So uh, please uh, forgive me if I interchange between Tantri, boss, right? Um, it's my honor to be here with you this morning. Uh, uh, our special guest, uh, Tantri, uh, does not need further introduction. Uh, and on behalf of uh, CFA Society in Malaysia, I welcome Tantri. Shall we give Tantri another round of applause, please? Um, I know you're very excited about the fire chat session, so uh, before we jump in, a few um, gentle reminders. Uh, if you're interested to ask Tantri a question, uh, kindly raise your hands, uh, and my colleagues from the society will hand over the mic to you. Uh, when you have the mic, uh, kindly speak into the mic, state your name, where you're from, and your question. So without further ado, um, shall I kick us off with the first question for Tantri? Um, Tantri, you joined CIMB Group in 1989 at 22 years old as an entry-level executive. You became CEO at 32, you retired as chairman in 2018. Uh, you spent 29 years of your career in one company. But these days, it's very common for professionals to hop around different companies to get different experiences. And I think in your speech, you outlined that, you know, we have to, pipe, we have to pick the right job, the right bosses, the right culture. But is this staying loyal culture uh, um, still relevant today? What do you think? Well, I, I, it worked for me. Um, and, um, but today when uh, young people come to me and say they want to change job to get another experience, I don't discourage them necessarily. Yeah. Uh, I think it's okay uh, to move around, uh, but not too frequently. I was looking at a CV today of someone uh, that I was thinking of offering a job. And then I realized that in something like 10 years, they had seven jobs. So I threw the CV away. Yeah. So it, you got to get the right balance. I think your CV must uh, be you know, methodical. Why did you go from one job to another? And, but don't forget, you know, longevity and loyalty uh, can pay off uh, as well. Uh, and I think you've got to get the right balance uh, for yourself. I mean, CIMB, <clears throat> I almost left CIMB a couple of times uh, during my career. Uh, each time I thought about it deeply, uh, but I realized that you know CIMB was still giving me the opportunity. CIMB was still paying me good money. Um, CIMB was still you know, kind of dangling the opportunity to rise up the corporate ladder. Uh, so I stayed, yeah. Uh, so it really is uh, uh, for everyone to make that decision. All right, thank you, Tansri, for your uh, advice. Um, right, let's open the floor to questions. Uh, any questions for Tantri? Please raise your hand. Thanks for injecting some hope among us, you know, in, in Malaysia. And uh, I love the country. It's, you know, I, mean, I have operations in Singapore. You know, as a young people, you all say, oh, Singapore is so nice, everything works, you know. And, uh, but in terms of leaving, Malaysia is still the most wonderful place. But we all struggle, right? have children, and they start thinking, and you're right, you know, I think you probably know numbers say a lot of this young talent, uh, Singapore paying not much more, but to be fair, it's not only money. I have a lot of friends, Malaysia children, even they make a lot more money, they actually long to be back in Malaysia. 
And I've been trying to find out what's really the problems. I think you probably uh, quite openly say is we have a political economy. Uh, our government 2.0 have all extended 50 years. Uh, so my question to you is really say, uh, what do we take us to break out of this government 2.0? I mean, as you say, leave it to parliament, uh, all this is not going to work and we have a fragmented government, it make it even more difficult. Everyone's moving to the populist move as well. Uh, so what is the root block you know, for what you're trying to do to move us into government 3.0? Uh, and what do you think is a probability that we are even able to get it within the next 10 years? Because really, uh, a lot of people are quite concerning. People are capital are leaving the country. I mean, for, talk about, for a while, talking about capital market, right? I mean, when we were in the 1990s, equity market, you know, Malaysia it was the darling, you know. Uh, uh, and today it's no longer relevant in the capital market. So I just thinking, I think the most critical part, how do we move and what are root blocks? How do we untangle the block? Well, thanks. Thank you, Goklin. Yes, Nansri, what are your take? Uh, well, I think what does it take for Malaysia to come out of this um, you know, situation and what's the probability to get there? Uh, thanks, uh, Goklin. Uh, Goklin had a... Well, I think we grew up about the same time, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, I remember Goklin, he bought my wife's car. Um, well, Colin, you know, I wrote to the uh, Agong in October 2018 uh, and on this idea of a better Malaysia citizens' assembly. Uh, and to be fair to the rulers, uh, they rather liked the idea uh, and they facilitated our engagement with the government. Uh, it was tabled to cabinet. Uh, not Surprisingly, uh, the cabinet is against it, uh, and you know, um, you know, they see it as a challenge to their power and so on and so forth. But it's not surprising. Uh, but it's a process uh, one needs to uh, go through. In other countries, uh, setting up all these citizens assemblies takes some time, uh, and eventually, you find the idea cropping into a lot of manifestos. Uh, and that may be uh, the only way we're going to get this done. Uh, so far, only MUDA has incorporated it into its manifesto. Uh, recently, uh, in Putri Wangsa, uh, in Johor, where MUDA has a seat, they had a citizens' assembly uh, to, uh, where they opened, they had a gathering of ordinary citizens in, for a day and they debated and deliberated what are the ideas for get, uh, having a better you know, Putri Wangsa. Uh, and, you know, we need to do this at a national scale. Um, so I am now taking the alternative route of campaigning with political parties uh, to embrace this. It is a slow process uh, and I would much rather this, you know, go through cabinet and parliament. Uh, top down is much faster. Uh, we tried that, uh, they are resisting, yeah. Uh, but, you know, there is an urgency to it uh, and, um, you know, it's frustrating. I was with Piyush uh, uh, just a couple of days ago, and I was extraordinary. You know, Piyush worked in, he was head of Citibank for about six years, Citibank Malaysia, and he bought a place here. He wanted to live here, but couldn't find a way to get PR. He goes to Singapore, CEO DBS. Within a week, the PM's office called him and offered him citizenship. Yeah, uh, and these are the kind of miss opportunities uh, in this country uh, because of this uh, this system uh, that is um, so deeply embedded that needs to be overhauled so um, i will do you know i'm trying to do what i can uh, but you know the more people speak out uh, for a new system uh, the better you see because a lot of the kind of liberals etc they talk about uh, systemic change, but it is this is too piecemeal. Yeah, this political funding reform stuff, right? What is it? Political funding, by definition, is transparency in funding. Who is going to be transparent in political funding when the PM controls the anti-corruption agency? Ain't going to happen. Yeah. So that's why I say everything is interlinked. 
Um, I've just joined this uh, all parties uh, parliamentary committee uh, for anti-corruption. And that's really the agenda I'm pushing through an alternative channel. That is uh, a, a, a committee, half parliamentarians, half uh, private sector, and trying to come up with uh, reform initiatives. And my first comment at my meeting, I said, look, we ain't going to change anything unless we deal with the balance of power with the institutions. That is where uh, you deal with corruption. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, uh, and you know, the other thing I would say is um, our reformists or liberals are also a problem on themselves. Yeah. Because people are here have become very extreme. So many of the reformists themselves, unless they, you know, unless you're able to talk to them in, in their lingo, they won't support you. And this is one of the frustrations I had with my Better Malaysia platform because I'd say I'm just a I just want to recommend a process, not a solution. But they're like, okay, okay, okay. But are you do you believe in uh, affirmative action? And I said that's not my that's not an issue. Let's have a conversation. But they cannot, you know, unless you commit that you believe in you know uh, every man being equal, then I'm not going to join you. So this is part of the problem also. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Tansri. Um, yes. Um, next question. Yes. Good morning. Okay, good morning, Vincent. Uh, my name is Tam Lik Chong. I'm a CFA member. Um, uh, in fact, I've changed my career path from financial sector, and right now uh, I'm in the uh, technology sector. I have uh, two tech companies right now, and um, one of the companies has been uh, recently identified by KPMG and HSBC as a potential unicorn in Malaysia, right? So uh, it's called Ecosys. So we provide retail technology solutions and uh, food tech as well. Here, here comes a question, right? We, how do we navigate the uh, political economy to, to build the next unicorn? Uh, and I know that everyone in Malaysia, uh, the government, be it the private sector or the banks as well, right? They've been trying to think, how are we able to, to, to really give birth to this unicorn, which, which makes Malaysia proud, right? Okay, Malaysia born unicorn as well. But um, the way I look at it, there's, you know, to be a unicorn, there's no way for us to stay in Malaysia forever. And, and hence, I'm forcing myself to go out from Malaysia, right? And this is how we expand to Indonesia, Vietnam, Singapore. Mm. But the more we do that, I realize that there's a brain drain. I'm, I'm pulling some of the best talents in Malaysia, okay, outside of Malaysia to grow those businesses with me in other countries. And it doesn't really help. That sooner or later, this is going to be a Malaysia-based unicorn, or, or we're going to lose our identity as a Malaysian company. Because the more we grow outside of Malaysia, I would say that the contribution for Malaysia would be like next to five percent or even ten percent to grow. Yeah. So that yep. defeats the purpose of us. Yep. You know, okay, growing okay. bigger and be proud of being a Malaysian yep. company. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. So back to Thanks, Tanshri. Tanshri. Right. So uh, Tanshri, I think the question here is um, firstly, how do you navigate this uh, political economy in Malaysia to uh, basically grow the next unicorn? Um, yeah. Uh, what's your take on that? I don't think there's an, you know, we'd be very proud if you're a Malaysian company and you're doing well in many countries. Your people may be based in Vietnam, etc. But, you know, so long as they are Malaysian and you pull them back for, for, for you know, uh, the earnings are coming back to Malaysia, etc. I think we should be proud of what you achieve. And of course, you know, uh, we feel that if you are really successful in, in all these other countries, it begs the question, why can't you be successful in Malaysia? Yeah, and here uh, for M Malaysia, I believe there is a systemic issue in terms of, um, you know, how business is divided out, basically, right? There's too much politics in decision making. Yeah, I think you should look at those potential customers that really make decisions based on merit. Yeah, that's where you should focus on. Uh, and, you know, but obviously, it's frustrating because some of the bigger contracts may be uh, ones where there's political influence. And there, uh, I go back to my, my, my suggestion earlier about how we reform uh, the role of government in, in business. Yeah, but I don't think you should you know, want to restrain your growth by not going to the other countries. Yeah, you should definitely go to the other countries. And when you go to the other countries, hire locally and maybe bring them back here. Yeah, that could be an idea of how you grow from strength to strength. But at some point, somebody's going to stand up and say, hey, this company is so successful in uh, the region. Why isn't it successful in Malaysia? And that's okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Tansri. 
Um, well, I mean, today's event is to also celebrate the, uh, uh, the completion of uh, some of our CFA members who, um, you know, who went through the uh, mentoring program. And you mentioned in your speech that, uh, you know, you have great mentors, mentors who uh, double down, help you double down on your strengths and help you to mitigate your weaknesses. So I guess the question here is, how did how did you go about picking your mentors? How you know for most of us here, you know, uh, we try to you know reach out to our network. But how do you know who's right? Because uh, you know sometimes mentors could be a hit or miss. What do you think? No, I think you 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 go with their reputations, right? Um, you know, as I described earlier, my first boss is someone I wanted as my mentor at that time, and that's what I needed at that time, but not for all times. Uh, and I always say this, you know, when people say, who, who do you aspire to, to you know, emulate? Um, I remember someone used to say to me, he said, which global investment bank does CIMB want to emulate? If I had given an answer then, I probably would have given Lehman Brothers. Yeah. So it's very dangerous to stick with one, you know, uh, uh, um, example. Uh, so throughout my career, I, you know, I kind of rode on different uh, mentors. Yeah. Uh, and I think uh, once you do that, don't knock yourself down. Right. Thank you, Tansri. Uh, next question. Yes. Uh, right. It's your name um, and then your question. Okay, very good morning, Tansri. And very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, I'm Dr. Paul from Taylor's University. Okay, recently we have read one news uh, saying that uh, about 500,000 people from Malaysia, I mean experts, are staying at overseas. They don't want to come back. They just want to stay there. So we are losing our experts. At the same time, uh, our country, uh, face, I mean, uh, are moving towards an aging nation. So once our aging people, I mean specialists, are retired, so we need those experts. So what our country must do to bring back or to avoid the same thing, I mean, the brain drain happen in the future again. Thank you, Tantri. Well, it's a multitude of things, uh, you know, of course, you know, people talk about pay, etc. But I think the whole thing goes back to the, the, the system, which I'm talking about, right? It's all interrelated. I think there's, you know, you're not going to be able, we're not going to pay people better packages because you know we're not earning enough the economy doesn't uh, work well enough the economy doesn't work well enough because the politics doesn't work well enough right so everything is intertwined so you know i i spent a year uh, at blavanik school thinking about this problem yeah uh, and i reflect back on the asian financial crisis the asian financial crisis we ref you know we, you compare malaysia with other countries right we reformed our corporate sector, right? Our GLCs, our business sector. You remember, I think Bursa, SE came out with books and books on governance. Kazana came out with books and books on governance, etc. What we didn't do was reform our political sector. Whereas in Indonesia, they overhaul everything, right? The whole system was overhauled. Yeah, in Korea, the whole system was overhauled. Right? And that is the difference. Because you didn't reform our politics, 10 years or 15 years later, politics came back into business sector with a vengeance. You know, and then you had your 1MDB and all your other crisis, you know, recent Serbo dynamic or whatever. Uh, all this because politics was never reformed. Yeah. So fundamentally, what we need to do is uh, reform the system as a whole. Thank you, Tantri. And thank you for your question. Um, next question. Yes. Uh, Go ahead. Morning, industry, and thanks again for the speech. Um, I'd like to actually take note of something you mentioned earlier just now about the slippery slope. And I think that's something that is very key to us CFA charter holders because we focus on ethics first and foremost. So my question here is this, um, as, and it's also very relevant to the younger generations. In your job, you have a, a boss or your superior who may be asking you to do something uh, that you feel that, hey, it could be a compromise, it could be crossing the line. Have you encountered something in your career and how did you actually manage that? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so you've just disclosed you didn't read my book. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So, you know, in my career, there have been many occasions. Lah. And I guess one of them I remember was um, for the IPO, my first IPO, that I was the corporate finance uh, staff on it. And I remember I worked for like almost a year, you know, that's how long it took those days. And then I got the approval letter from the SC or CIC then. I was so excited. Then I went back to my office. The file was missing from my desk. Then I didn't know what the hell is going on. Then the next day, the file landed back on my desk. And I looked at it. The file had, uh, uh, they put in there that the allocation of the Bumiputra shares would be given to Mr. X. And I was very, very upset because I realized then that you know, I couldn't figure out why Mr. X got it. Why didn't PNB get it? Why didn't you know, uh, you know, LTAT get it? Why was it given to Mr. X? And then I was very traumatized because you know, it had to involve people within my own company at that time. Uh, but I never found out why. You know, and then I remember the listing ceremony. Finally, this guy came. You know, he was the new Boomi shareholder, a huge amount of shares. So they pointed him to the board. He sat down and you look at him, you knew. He had no idea what the company did. Yeah, uh, and that is, you know, the kind of thing that happened. I was very upset, I resigned. Uh, but, you know, then, at that time, then the, a lot of things changed in the company and, 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 and I was persuaded to stay on. Um, then I also document in the, uh, in the book how in 1998, when RHB came to, um, to buy, to take over CIMB, right? I couldn't figure it out because RHB was in trouble. CIMB was strong, then how come RHB is buying CIMB or Commerce then? Uh, and I remember being given the message, if you don't allow this deal, uh, then Bangalore will remove you uh, from the board of CIMB and out. Lah. So at that time, I discussed with my CEO, Tan Sri Matno then. So I said, look, what do we do, right? And then we both talked about it and said, look, we just have to do what's right and hope for the best. So we basically called the press conference and refused to do the deal. Uh, and of course, I just waited to be removed. Uh, but you know, the political, there was a political um, fallout then, Anwar got removed uh, and so on and, and, and we survived. So those are the kind of, a couple of uh, instances that I had to face when, you know, um, um, I guess there were powers trying to uh, force me to compromise uh, and I, and I didn't, and you know, I, I didn't always get it right. Um, I think, you know, it's very dangerous when you hear people, they already talk about the good stories when they always get it right. Uh, I would never claim that. I think, you know, uh, ethical challenges will always come. You just do your, your best, right? To make sure that you, 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 you make the, uh, the right uh, decisions, like decisions that you can live with. I mean, I can live with all my decisions. Even when I made a mistake, uh, I can live with why I made the mistake because it wasn't intentional or there were uh, extenuating circumstances. And back to my point about systems, why system is important. I remember in Niaga, uh, in Indonesia, we had this branch manager that was the best branch manager ever, right? He was straight. Uh, and, you know, high performing. And then one day we discovered that he was stealing. He was siphoning money. Uh, and then when we investigated, why was he siphoning the money? It's because his wife had cancer. So more, you know, from, from you know, how do you look at that, right? Actually, if you look at it from a moral standpoint, you could argue that he did the right thing, right? Put his wife first, his wife's life first. Right. So then it goes back to this point where you need systems to basically, um, um, uh, you know, um, <clears throat> protect you against those kind of things. That's why on a macro level, we also need the right systems so that people are guided. I have seen really good people go into politics with absolutely the right intentions to make a better country. Then when they go in, they look at the system, they have to make very tough choice. Either I compromise my principles or I'm out. If I choose to stay, then I have to compromise a bit. Then after a while, they compromise a bit more. 
they bend a little, bend a little, until suddenly they discover they're completely bent. Right? And, you know, then, then what do they do, right? Uh, so this is the issue of the system. The system today in politics, people ask me, oh, I can't go to politics. But if I go into politics, in order to survive, I have to be so bent. Right? There's no point in doing it. Right? Um, so, you know, even in companies, you know, systems are important. So why not uh, at, at the national level? Yeah, thank you, Tansri. Um, I guess just talking about having a um, you know, good system in place, um, the CFA Society uh, you know, prioritizes ESG, right? Uh, I think um, uh, the CFA Institute uh, recently wrote out the certificate in uh, ESG uh, investing, right? So I just want to hear, you know, what's your take on ESG? Uh, and of course, these days, uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, non-ESG policies that the Western countries has adopted, right? Uh, just in response to um, pragmatism. So what's your take on ESG? Is it relevant or is it just a bunch of uh, alphabet? No, I think, you know, <clears throat> we're all waking up to the fact that this, you know, Friedman thesis doesn't quite work, right? Uh, that you can't just make money and leave, <clears throat> leave markets to do everything. Um, in the end of the day, I think even at company level, it's we need to put purpose first, right? And profits uh, will come after that. Um, and in terms of purpose, built into purpose, I think we all have to step up and take responsibility for what's happening uh, in the environment and other uh, social um, uh, factors. Um, and, you know, it is a huge change that I think we haven't got right yet. And we had a discussion I think Azman Mokhtar had a, uh, arranged a discussion the other day on how we go forwards in this. And one of the issues, uh, I think, is that, you know, uh, we still need uh, to, to, to kind of get everybody on side. Because at the moment, you know, in, in, in the West, you've seen many people, many CEOs who go around saying, you know, I'm ESG, purpose first, blah, blah, blah. And then when they don't deliver ROE, they get kicked out. Yeah. So actually, the accountants have to come in and come up with a second bottom line, which is a ESG-driven bottom line, like to deduct the the the, the cost to, to climate, uh, etc., uh, so that people can actually be judged uh, by the right matrix. Uh, this is how you build in ESG properly. Otherwise, we all talk, 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 talk. You don't deliver ROE, you, you're out. Right. Thank you, Tantri. Um, yes. Uh, next question, please. All oh, right. Yes, uh, the lady. Go ahead. Your name, uh, where you're from, and then your question. Uh, hello, hi. Uh, I'm Saida Asila, a licensed friendship planner, and one of the CFA uh, mentees uh, program. So uh, my questions. Uh, so in my practice, uh, as a licensed friendship planner, I have few clients. Uh, so they earn degrees. However, they are eyeing to migrate, willing to migrate, as even as a labor. And also to early 40s uh, clients, they work as uh, engineers, uh, banking industry. They also are in, uh, an opportunity to migrate. Uh, even ask me, do you have network uh, for, for me to, to have a chance to go overseas? And uh, in my, from my experience, uh, when I did master's degree in UK, so nine years ago, uh, where top Malaysian students, non bumi they apply scholarship from Singapore government. Uh, they don't, they, they, do, they don't have to pay anything, and they can work in Singapore. As, I think that's the brain drain. And uh, your question is? And my question is, in your opinion, how we all professionals here can motivate those millennials? For example. Um, I can see that uh, mentor mentee program is a very good program, uh, which can motivate uh, like me lah, a millennial. Uh, but how about how about those outside? I don't. Uh, how are we all here can work together. I see. Uh, yes. Got it. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you for your question. So Tanshu, I think the question uh, um, from our uh, friend here is, um, how do you um, encourage uh, this culture of mentorship, right? Uh, when there are, uh, and I think there's there's a there's a summary of some uh, Malaysians who just you know they don't mind going out, uh, you know good talent, but they just want to migrate, get out of this country, and settle for a slightly lower end jobs. Um, 
So do we have enough mentorship in, in corporate Malaysia? Uh, is there a way for us to kind of increase this culture of mentorship? And, and obviously you're very blessed with very good mentors throughout your career. No, I believe strongly in this mentorship. In fact, at uh, Bank Pembangunan, uh, what you know, I'm trying to shift is this whole... Um, I don't think our companies, our SMEs have a problem with, with raising money necessarily, right? They don't just need money, they need mentorship. They need guidance. Uh, so I would encourage even banks, right, to actually have mentorship for entrepreneurs, etc. I think it's very, very important. But to um, your kind of bigger question about how to retain talent in Malaysia, I think it's, it's back to uh, what we discussed earlier, which is the need for people to, um, to have hope uh, and believe that this country, right, can give them the right opportunities. Uh, and I think, you know, at the moment, it's kind of dark times, uh, but, you know, let's, let's all collectively speak out uh, and hope that, uh, you know, that we can have that systemic change uh, that I think will, you know, Malaysians, <clears throat> you remember, I think when Kazana, when Talent Corp came, a lot of people came back. Uh, and even when Pakatan came in, a lot of people came back. Uh, so there are a lot of Malaysians out there who are, you know, want to come back. Uh, so we have to give people hope um, uh, that, you know, Malaysia can, can fulfill its potential. Uh, and this is our home and uh, we should fight for it. All right. Thanks, Tansri. Um, yes, um, one, one question from the back. Um, can we, uh, yes, your name, um, where you're from, and then your question. Yep. My name is Johnston and I'm from Southern Capital. Um, this is more of a philosophical and a personal question, but the premise is, I'm pretty sure it applies to everyone. At some point in our lives, we always ask, like, why am I here? What am I meant to achieve in this life? So my question is, have, do you think you have found your purpose? And at what point did you find your purpose? And if so, do you think you have achieved your purpose already? Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Oh, deep, Justin Shri, very deep, deep question. <laughs> You're from Southern Capital, that's the PE firm, isn't it? Okay, you're investing the money I paid for Southern Bank, I think. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think that, you know, for the longest time, I thought my purpose was to build CIMB, right? So in 2018, um, the government then took it away from me. Uh, and then I had to reevaluate. Um, so I went to... I took a year in Oxford and really thought about life and what I should be doing. And, you know, I think I, I kind of realized that, look, <clears throat> after 29 years at CIMB, you know, it, it is a legacy and something I can be very proud of. Uh, so that's done. Um, and my purpose now, I think, is, you know, I'm comfortable. Um, so I think that, you know, given my vantage point, uh, I owe it uh, to... to to the country uh, to try and do what I can uh, in order to make a better Malaysia. Yeah, that's really how I, I, I look at my, my, my role now, lah, my purpose now. I think we all have, um, <clears throat> I don't think it's, we, all, uh, we can have one purpose in life. Right? I think that we have multiple things that we can do. Um, humans are very, very talented. Uh, so at different parts, of, different parts of your life, uh, I think, you know, you can have different agendas uh, and uh, this is my agenda now. All right. Thank you, Tansri. Um, Tansri, today we have a lot of uh, fund managers, a lot of CFA charter holders. So we do have to cover a little bit about investments, right? So I would like to ask you, uh, based on the current outlook, your outlook, where would you allocate? <laughs> Nola Winston. If I knew that, I wouldn't hire you. <laughs> right. Thank you, Tanshri. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, yes. No, uh, no. If you want to talk about investments, yes. I mean, obviously, our you know, I have a PE firm, and we 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 are very focused on technology, finance logistics and consumer, we think that those are the key sectors of the future. All right. Thank you. Um, yes, next question. Hey, hi. Just, Justin. Hi, Tan Sri. Yes. This is Justin Ong, partner with Deloitte. 
I'm also the immediate past president. So let's thank, thank you for your time, spending a very, very valuable time with the, the mem members and, and guests and friends of the society. Um, following your, your, your thoughts around, in a way, the better Malaysia, the best interests of Malaysia, the, the big elephant in the room in the country today is about the upcoming election. Right. While there are still a lot of un uncertainty, I think a lot of variables, a lot of scenario that will play out. Um, so everyone in the room here will agree with me that we want the best of the con con country. That's a shared interest. That's a shared perspe perspective, right? What would be the best outcome? What would the best scenario that could happen to, to the upcoming elections in your, in your view and perspective? Thank you, Justin. Yes, country. Well, I think certainty. Yeah, I think we need political certainty. Uh, and I think we don't want anyone to get two thirds. Um, uh, that would be dangerous, I think, but a comfortable majority uh, for one party uh, would be good. Unfortunately, the way I look at these elections, I don't think we're going to get that because I think it's going to be, a, so far, I think it'll probably be a three way. Uh, when you have three way, you could have one party getting 40% of votes. Uh, and having possibly, you know, even near to two-thirds. Uh, and in which case, you have that uncomfortable <clears throat> kind of feeling that, you know, um, um, of legitimacy uh, can get uh, uh, a bit uncomfortable. Yeah, um, I think that uh, to take that further, you know, part of what I'm uh, arguing is that we actually need to change the electoral system in this country. Because uh, at the moment, the way the constituencies are uh, laid up is actually the source, the, the beginning of the problems. Right? You're getting constituencies with 95% Malays. Right? You have Tony Poas constituency, like almost 95% non-Malays. Right? So, you know, that kind of constituency delineation is not fair uh, and also, you know, encourages, you know, uh, identity politics. Uh, we need to adopt a more proportional system uh, and a system where you get mixed constituencies, right? You must have mixed constituencies as far as possible. I think if you had that, then you would encourage our politicians to be more moderate uh, in their um, campaigns and also in their votes in parliament. And then I, I think you still you start bringing the country uh, to a better place. Yeah, thank you, Tantri. Um, uh, Vincent, we'll have one more. Sh sure. Um, last question from, final question from the floor. Yes. Um, don't mean to be the last one, because I, I think the, the, the mentees questions are actually more important, but um, thank you for your, for your frankness and your transparency, uh, Tan Sui. Uh, again, this question is actually more uh, on behalf of the, the mentees, I, I hope. Um, if you were a young professional today, what, what advice would you give, uh, you know, in terms of the choice of, of sector and I suppose is it private sector or government sector that, that you should move your career into because you know like going back to your point about GLCs, GLIs for example they have the, the weight of the government behind them and you know speaking from my years of, of investing I've noticed that there is a, a major crowding out effect that happens as a result of, of that. So if you wanted to build a career would it be better to find your, your, your vision or your, your, your journey within a JLC with the support of the government, with the mentors that come within that, or would you try to tough it out within the SME sector where, you know, the, the world's your oyster, but you have a lot less opportunities? Uh, yeah. I think it's horses for courses. Uh, it depends on uh, the individuals uh, themselves and whether they can operate within a JLC environment uh, or they are inherently uh, more entrepreneurial. Uh, I think I don't like to say that, you know, for everyone, this is the, the right path for you. I think, you know, you have to make your own decisions. And I think whether it's private sector or GLC, I go back to what I said earlier about the importance of the company uh, as well as uh, your uh, immediate superior, at least at the early uh, part of your career. But when you're thinking of which line to take, I think what's more important uh, is don't make decisions based on the past. Right, make decisions based on how you anticipate the future. Yeah, I, you know, those days when I went into banking, actually, I got lucky because at that time it wasn't a career. Banking was a stepping stone to a proper career. That's what my brothers told me: go and join a merchant bank, 
understand the corporate sector, then go and join Sam Dhabi or one other the other corporates. That was the plan. Uh, so I got lucky. As it turned out, it was the, the beginning of the golden era of banking. Yeah. And today, if you want to join banking, yeah, it's still okay. But I'm not sure uh, whether <clears throat> I'm not sure. You know, certainly the future of banking is not the same. Yeah, it's definitely not going to be accelerated growth. Um, it's more steady state. Um, <clears throat> the exciting, there are other exciting industries uh, um, uh, or legs of finance uh, that you should contemplate are based on how you anticipate the future. You know, for instance, of course, I'm biased towards private equity. Um, I'm biased towards um, uh, the digital side. I think that's probably where the future is. Yeah, uh, but don't resign tomorrow, Lisa. Right, I, I'm afraid that's all the time we have for this fire chat session with Tansri Nazish. Shall we give Tansri another round of applause? Uh, uh, Tansri, on behalf of the society, uh, thank you for spending your time uh, with us at this uh, Saturday morning. And uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you have learned a lot uh, from Tansri's uh, uh, sharing today. Uh, as Tansri has alluded earlier, if you would like to hear more, more wisdom, more nuggets, well, we have the book corner over there. <laughs> right, I'll hand the time back to Farid and Sini. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank Tansri. you very much, Tansri and Winston, for your insightful interaction. Uh, like what Tansri and Winston have said, unfortunately, we don't have time. If you want to know more about uh, Tansri's life story, like they have a really stress over that table there. The books are available. All right, now moving on, we would like to call upon Su Jihui to share with you the outcome of our Future Leaders Mentoring Program 2022. Over to you, Jihui. Good morning, mentors, mentees, and esteemed guests. My name is Jihui, so I'm the Program Director for this Future Leaders Mentoring Program. So it's my greatest pleasure to be here and celebrate the graduation of the Future Leaders Mentoring Program participants. Now, allow me to give some background to this program. The Future Leaders Mentoring Program was first launched in 2021 to connect seasoned industry practitioners with young professionals who aspire their career further. So before we launched the program in 2021, the society has been having something similar back when we were doing our career day. So it was in the form of a short, um, a very short uh, touch and go kind of um, counseling sessions where participants could actually go and visit the booths of our mentors who volunteer as a counsellor. So seeing how well received this counselling session was at the career day event, we thought of bringing something back to the society members and making it a longer, longer lasting, with longer lasting impact. So to date, we have matched over 50 pairs of mentors and mentees through the program and throughout the three months program, our mentors and mentees are encouraged to have a conversation together at least twice a month. So for this year's cohort, we actually admitted 27 pairs of mentors and mentees. And in the past three months, we have actually held three workshops on personal development and also 59 mentoring sessions. And these are all one-to-one -one mentoring sessions. So something we are also very pleased to see is that outside of the standard one-to-one -one mentoring sessions, we also had group mentoring sessions where the mentees took the initiative to speak to each other and then they decided that, hey, I think I would like to learn something from your mentors and I think I would like to hear more about what you do as well. So I think this is something that we were very, very happy to see that when the mentees are connecting to each other to broaden their exposure. So the aim of the program is to create opportunity for our future leaders to have a shoulder to stand on and a giant to learn from. With close to 1,000 members in the society, Imagine how far we can go by tapping into the collective wisdom of the members. And that is exactly what we did. So as a consultant myself, I think what we do very well is in leveraging the works of others, in leveraging the wisdom and the knowledge of our colleagues. So when we started this program, we reach out to our, the people we know, then we ask around like, hey, we feel that you, know, um, you have the right profile for certain uh, mentees who have applied for this program and we hope that you could come on board and join as a mentor and that is exactly what we did and we had a lot of strong supporters for the program. So while this sounds like a self praise, CFA Society in Malaysia is truly a wonderful society with members who are passionate and supportive in grooming our future leaders. So throughout the years, the society has been having in the Institute Research Challenge, the Ethics Challenge, 
career days, and of course the mentoring program. And all of the all the while, we have never had a shortage of volunteers who, to serve the role as a mentor or a counselor. So after all, we are not the most outstanding society without good reasons. So to our mentors, I'd like to express my heartfelt gratitude to all of you, especially to those who have returned for a second time. So thank you for being generous in sharing your time and wisdom. Thank you for being the mentors of our members and in making the society and uh, sorry, yeah, the society and also Malaysia stronger together. So these are the list of all the mentors that we have admitted in 2021 and 2022. It was very unfortunate that last year um, our graduation was in the form of Zoom. So this year we managed to have uh, more people come, come and celebrate together in person. So today's celebration is not just a celebration of the completion of this program for our mentees, but also a celebration of the volunteerism and also the mentorships of all our volunteers. So as for our mentees, kudos for taking charge of your own development. There are many things to learn in life and having a mentor certainly helps to make your journey less bumpy. I know most of you are young professionals or even fresh graduates. And I am like me, I, I feel very small in front of many of the giants that stand before us today. So fret not um, if you're not, if you don't feel like, like a giant yet, because everyone begins as a blank canvas with little to no experience. So what I would like, as I, how I've always been doing is finding my own pace and keep painting our own canvas layer by layer, stroke after stroke. And that is how we work to, to become a masterpiece of self. So every step we take eventually will lead to somewhere. So one day we hope to see our mentees returning as a giant with the shoulders to land on for others. So I think today we have heard a lot of fascinating stories um, from the giants. So if I can share a little embarrassing story of mine, just to show how important the mentorship is. So back when I was still in high school, so I thought I wanted to do something different instead of just doing um, my studies and taking exams and whatnot. So I decided to apply for the editorial, for a position on the editorial board of the high school camp. So I went, I applied for it. I had an interview and I prepared everything. I taught everything um, except for the English interview session. So when I went up there, I struggled. <laughs> My English was so, so awful that I eventually just asked the interviewer, could, could you just, can, can we do this in Mandarin? <laughs> so the interview was in English and my broken English was so bad that I couldn't continue the conversation. So I, I move on and I asked to have the conversation in Mandarin instead. The interviewer was very kind enough to agree. And then we had it in Chinese, in Mandarin. And eventually I did get the position, but from there, I also do realize where my weakness lies. So echoing what Tan Sri has just said about men in the mirror, look at yourself and see where you can grow from there. So that was what I thought. I want to fix my broken English. But as a high schooler, 16 years old, I did not know better. So what I did was I thought I find a way to see, you know, how I could improve my own English. So I went to open up, my solution was to that was I went to open up a copy of the Harry Potter book. And I start flipping every page, I read every single sentence, every single word. Whenever I come across a word I do not understand, I will just pause and will flip up the dictionary and start writing down the meaning. That helped. Other things I did was I took up um, a job as a part-time telephone surveyor, just so that I could speak to people without feeling embarrassed and that I could practice my English from there. So another thing I did was, of course, joining the Toastmaster later on. So there's, you can see I did a lot of things just to fix my English. But in the end, what I found out was the, the activities that had the greatest impact on me was where I had someone to show me the rope. So when I was in Toastmaster, I had my friends who told me, no, Jihui, this is how you should complete the, the sentence. You know, this is how you can start with a so-called impromptu uh, speech and whatnot. So I had people to show me the rope. I had people to tell me what are the mistakes to avoid and things and whatnot. So these are all the, the, the work, the impact that um, some, having someone to guide you can bring. And this is the change and impact that we would like to bring to our society members, to the community um, at large. So, of course, I think with that said, I definitely look forward to seeing more applications next year 
for this mentoring program. And hopefully you can give me more headache to find out how we can pair different people up together. All right, so before I proceed to the next, uh, next part, I would like to also thank the program committee and the society team, and also the board of directors for making this program possible. A special thanks to Nabila, our director, to Priscilla and Vincent, our mentor and mentee lead, the two who has been bugging you on WhatsApp. I hope they have been making good, uh, making friends with you all the while. And of course, to the, the society team and also the board who have been participating in many different ways in this program. And now, before we close off, I'd like to announce the winner for a little competition that we held during the program. So before that, can we invite our president, Chong Jing Yong, to come up the stage to award their prizes? All right, so to spice things up a bit, we are rewarding our mentors and mentees for their active participation in meeting up and sharing their learnings on LinkedIn. So the winner for our most active mentor and mentee are Alan Lim and Cheng Banju. And of course, we also have Saida, the most active mentee on LinkedIn. So can we have uh, Saida and Banju to come up to the stage to receive their prizes? It's unfortunate that Alan could not join us today, but here we have our most active mentees to it together. As you have seen, Saida was the one who was asking the question as well. Once again, congratulations, Saida and Banju. I will now pass the time back to the MC. And thank you so much again for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jehui. We will now have the mock check presentation to University of Malaya Urological Cancer Trust Fund. So as we all know, today's ticket proceeds are channeled to this fund. And we would like to invite Mr. Hussein Ahmed from UM up the stage, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone.